But look at 1 Timothy 5 verse 14. 1 Timothy 5 verse 14. It says the following. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have in fact already turned away to follow Satan. What is he saying here? It, it sounds so, so simple. But what is he saying here? He's actually using a word. He's using a word um, that will shock us. Because the word is not just serving, the managing. It's actually it is actually the verb of despotos. So the wife is the despotos in the family. The one who takes the lead. The house despots. That is what it means. So please be careful. Um, next time you speak to your wife, um, think about it. She is the despot. She is the one who is in charge. And yes, today, even if you go to different, uh, the different places, and even, even here in, in the city of Antwerp, uh, where we have uh, uh, ten thousands of Jews living, uh, what, what you see is that uh, male and female are separated in the sense that the male will walk, walk together and the female will walk together. And with the female you have the children. And so some people say, when you look at from, from the outside, when you look at them from the outside, you see, um, seemingly the husbands are the, the rulers of the house. When you talk to them, you will have a different, you will hear a different story. Because inside the house, inside the home, suddenly the wife is the leader. Suddenly she takes the... Uh, the decisions and she actually orders her husband again we have to be careful because it's, it's in balance um, somebody asked uh, a Jew do you help your wife with the, uh, the household tasks and he looked at the, the, the one who was questioning him he was not sure what to say and how to say it. And he said, uh, if she asked me to help her, that is an insult for herself. Because that means that she's not doing a good job. So when a husband asks his wife, can I help you? That's negative. Although in our society it looks very positive. In Jewish society, that's very negative. That is saying, she's not doing a good job. I have to help her. She needs a helper. Yes, that's the, that's the way they look at it. So, again, we have another text in that same book of Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, verse 12. 1 Timothy 2, verse 12. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. And then he gives a reason. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, so if you take this text separate, any woman who has no children is unable to be saved. 
That's what the text is saying. Okay? So I'm not, uh, I'm not going into that argument because I don't believe that's what he's saying. That is what it looks like. And, and that's the, the problem here. Is it looks like something he's saying that he's actually not really saying, but he's bringing some ideas to the forefront. Okay. So, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. How do you how do you how do you go about with uh, with the text in Titus in in Titus um, Titus one uh, the appointing of the elders the uh, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might. Uh, that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, uh, a man whose children believe, and so on. But again, we looked at it already before in, 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 in Timothy, so it is similar to it. And then you have, in, in, in First Timothy, I do not permit a wife to have uh, that type of authority. Okay, let's go to chapter 2, verse 12, in First Timothy. We, we, we stay in the, same, in the same place. So 11 was, a woman should not learn, uh, sorry, a woman should learn in quietness, full submission, in, in, and 12 is, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over men, she must be quiet. She must learn in full, in, in submission. If, if I, if I try to, to learn something, and I'm not doing it in submission, then what happens is that uh, I most probably will do something wrong. It's like like having a, a manual and not using it. Because the manual is saying you have to do it this way, this is the good way of doing it, and you think, oh, I don't need a manual, I know how it functions. And then after an hour or two you discover, no, I'm not, I'm not doing it in full submission to what I can do because I have a manual. And of course, in, in spiritual matters, we have the manual, which is the book, the Bible, the book of God, the word of God, speaking to us. So, in full submission means that we have to do it in a certain way. So, women have to do it in a certain way. They have to do certain things. Um, but you have to look at the, the whole context. In chapter 2, in verse 8, for example, it says, Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up their holy hands without anger or disputing. So if you have anger or you have a dispute with someone, you cannot pray? Is that what, it's, is that what he is saying? That's not what he is saying. And he's saying everywhere. That doesn't mean that we have to pray everywhere. No. Everywhere where, where you have people who are gathering together or people who are Christians, they have to do certain things in a certain way. So that's one thing. And on the other hand, verse 9, I want the, the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with uh, elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. And then you have these women, they have to do according to what they have, namely the Bible, the, uh, um, the manual. Okay. So that's one, one, one thing. So it is, it is the, 
the, the issue here is the, the, to assume authority. Because I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. Who are the women we are talking about? Well, I said before, there are two words. You have women and you have the wife. You have two Greek words. One is woman, one is wife. And here you have the wife. Of course you can translate it into woman. There's no problem. Absolutely no problem. When you say woman and you mean the wife, that's fine. As long as you understand it's inside a family matter. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the, uh, the man. Uh, everywhere man should pray according. Praying is not just praying in general, it's, it's specifically worshipping, because that's, that's the issue here. In verse 10, you have the, the women who profess to worship God. So it's, it's in the context of worship. And so you can, you, can, you can say you have a, a, a meeting at your home where you do worship. R remember, we talked about that before, that Jesus changed the rules of the ten people coming together to start a, uh, a service in a synagogue. In the New Testament with Jesus, you have two or three gathering together. That's a family. So in a, in a, family, this, in a family context, you have this thing going on between the husband and the wife, the man and the woman. Um, what, what we have to what we have to understand here is that assume authority over men is specifically saying said here. Okay, Th this is not you cannot you cannot say this is the rule all over. This is what pa uh, what Paul is saying to Timothy about a very specific issue, namely the worship service. Let me say it this way, most probably in the home. Of course, you can say worship services are also done as a church, as a group of people. Yes, they are. And then the rules are being laid out in 1 Corinthians 15. That's where we have these rules. So, since we have 1 Corinthians 14 already, and being in existence long before 1 Timothy was written, this must be speaking of a, a different type of, of, of worship or a different type of meeting or be an addition to it. But when it's an addition, it should be not, not said the way it is being said. It should be a way of looking at it in a uh, more continuous way. So I don't think we can say that this is the, uh, the verses not use the New Testament standard for exercising authority. Okay. Um, let me see in Ephesus 5. We talked about that before. Ephesus 5. Let's look at the husband's Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and give himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water to the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this, in this same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for, for their body, just as Christ does for his church. And then for every... So, 
this is when you when you think of the 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 way women have to look at look up to their husbands and and husbands have to look up to their wives there is a again a similarity and the the, the problem behind all this is that certain people uh, misuse the possibilities to have unauthorized authority. Unauthorized authority is an authority that is not being given by the church to a certain person. Um, I remember being in a church and someone from another church came in meeting on a Sunday morning and while the sermon was ongoing, suddenly that man stood up and said, You are wrong! And, and everyone turned around and said, What is going on here? That man had no authority of saying it. But he was saying it. What I'm, what I'm trying to explain is that you have people who have given authority inside the church. That is the way um, the way spiritual gifts are working. Spiritual gifts are coming up into a, to a li to the lives of people and then the, the, those people are using those spiritual gifts and the church has to accept those spiritual gifts and you can almost say um, authorize what they are doing. What that man was doing by standing up against someone who was preaching was not authorized. So he has he has unauthorized assumption. And that is what is not allowed for male, but also not allowed for women. So when you have women who have authority or taking authority, which they are not supposed to do, then they should be quiet. Then they should be silenced even. And if they are not silenced, or if they make too much noise, you have to kick them out of the church building. Because it is not proper to do so. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14 that the church is a place of order. When you have order, such a thing should not come into the church meetings. But yeah, you have those people. So, uh, one is the authority, to assume authority, which was not been given to them and the second thing is that some women and well not only women but also men but, but women are more prone to that um, some women are being, are being influenced by false teachers and those false teachers are bringing wrong ideas into the church and so when a woman starts talking to other people about what she thinks, what she heard from the false teacher, and she brings into the church, that is unauthorized. That is, she is deceived by a false teacher, and the false teacher is being deceived by Satan. So it comes from Satan over the false teacher through that person, in some cases women, we have to understand that uh, in church, two thirds of the people, two thirds of the people, two thirds of the Christians are women. Uh, don't ask me why. I'm, I'm not able to give you an answer to that. The only thing is that's the reality of today. That is, women are two thirds of the congregations. So it is more prone to have women doing certain things. Seemingly, that was already happening in the first century. So we are not talking about something new. The same thing goes about 
about ages. In, in the New Testament, you find hardly young people. This, uh, Jesus is, is, is dealing with some children. But you never, he you never heard of, of, of something like what we call a teenager. A teenager coming to Jesus. No, I mean, it's not written in, in the New Testament. Or Paul writing to a teenager. Or one of the other apostles writing to a teenager. Or have an encounter with a teenager. It's never even mentioned. So, we see that the age inequality was probably there also. And so we have a number of things. More women than men. More older people than young people. And that is exactly what you see in church today. When you go to different churches, we call them, uh, I don't want to be uh, blamed for that, so don't quote me on, that, on this, we call them the gray wolves. Because they are always there. The gray hair people. Yes, they are. So, we see that a church is not an exact representation of society. Society has, um, what is it, 51% women and 49% of men. But in church, you have one-third men and two-thirds of women. So, this gives you an idea how do you, look, how do you have to look at it. So, assuming authority which is not given to you, being influenced by outside influences, most probably false teachers, because that is the one we, we see, we've seen the apostles talking about in the, in the New Testament. So, when you would have a, a, a woman like, for example, Priscilla, the one who is married to Aquila, um, She's probably the one who, most probably the one who brought the book of Ephesus to Ephesus. So if she did that, um, I think in church they would ask, what is this? And she probably would have spoken about it. So it is not so much... Uh, a difference between male and female it is the ones who are having authority given authority using it against other ones who are not having the authority and still trying to, to assume authority um, like I said Achille and Priscilla uh, Priscilla's name is first in Acts 18 verse 18 26 in Romans 16 verse uh, three. That is, you have to understand, that is against, against the culture of that day. That is against what we call the, uh, uh, the, 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 the convention of, of Greek writing. I, I think you find, except for the, 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 the letters of Paul, I don't know whether there exists any text where you find females being first mentioned before uh, the males. So, again, that is for us important. So, in, verse, in 1 Timothy 2, verse 12, it does not pro, uh, prohibit women as Priscilla and Phoebe uh, who had properly recognized authority for teaching but people without recognized authority are the ones uh, who are prohibited by this thing. One other thing uh, about elders and deacons is, is the question or of, of people asking whether you have to be married to be a deacon or an elder when you look at the, the different texts and especially the ones we looked at already in 1st Timothy and, and uh, Titus 
because both of them meant something about the family. Uh, so, let's assume that you have to be married and then you have to assume that when you're married, you also have children. So if you're married and not have children, you're disqualified to become a deacon or an elder. Um, what happens if someone who is not married knocks at your door and says, I would like to become a deacon or an elder of the church? What can you say? Oh, well, sorry. Uh, let's see. Uh, First Timothy 3. You have to be married. So please go to another... Oh, no, no. Can't go to another church. Uh, we have to find you another ministry. But say he, he fits in all the different uh, qualifications we talked about before. Hospitable, good behavior, able to teach, temperate, sober, uh, blameless, well known in, in society, and so on and so on. But he's not married. Okay, so what we have to we have to look at is is being married a prerequisite of an elder or deacon? And if so, that means that a non married person cannot be a deacon or an elder. Same goes if you're married and have no children, are you then qualified or can you qualify to become a deacon or an elder? Some people will say, according to the text, no. But most of the uh, uh, most of the, 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 the commentaries would say it is not because you are not married that you cannot be a deacon or an elder, or it's not because you don't have children and you're married that you not can become a deacon or an elder. Because the the marriage to one woman has nothing to do with the one woman as such, then against the backdrop of the back, the background of uh, the idea that it is sexual purity we are talking about. In the sense that you're not having different wives, just one. If you're married, you have one wife, you not have two. If you have children, you take them and you, 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 have, you have to control them. I'm not saying that uh, a child should be a perfect child because if you say that you need to be perfect as a Christian. If you're not perfect as a Christian you cannot demand of your children to be perfect. If you're not perfect as a Christian how can you be perfect as a deacon or an elder? So that would disqualify you. No, it does not disqualify you. It is clearly that when you are married you have to have one wife. When you have children, those children have to be under your control. Of course, we are not talking about, for example, in my case, um, my, uh, my oldest daughter is um, 48. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. That would be difficult. I mean, she's married, she has children, uh, or my son, who is uh, 46, uh, even his daughter is already, is already married. So do I have authority over my son and my granddaughter and the little one in the making? Of course not. Okay, because I, this is not my, 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 my home. This is part of my family, my extended family. So that is what it says here. Okay? You, you, when, you, when you have children that are adults, they have to act like adults. You don't have to act in their place. They have to do it and, and do it right according to what the Bible is teaching. So don't, don't disqualify uh, a man that wants to be a deacon or an elder because he's not married. Or he has no children. Okay, let's let's have a word of prayer. 
Father in heaven, we thank you for what you have in your word and what you are giving us and what we can understand. So please, let us understand your word. When we need wisdom, you said we have to ask for wisdom. So we ask you wisdom in those specific issues. We also ask you to bless us so that we can become a blessing to the people around us. Glorify your name in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.